Hi, I'm Jim Beers, and I just got asked the question, what about the Nature Conservancy, and what about the Hatch Act? Because I've mentioned this before in some thing, conversations I've had, and I'll take on the Nature Conservancy first. Nature Conservancy is a very, very rich organization. They, they are worth billions of dollars. They own land, I think, all over the world now, but certainly all over the United States. And that land is a, is a source of income for them, and they tend, to, they tend to be the creature, if you will, of, of fairly influential and well-to-do people within the United States, and I think in Europe, too. But be that as it may, people like uh, Paul Paulson, who was the uh, Secretary of Treasury under Secre uh, President Bush, uh, are executive directors and high board members and that of this group. And the thing about the Nature Conservancy that, that I mentioned to people is that the Nature Conservancy, among other things, buys land and holds it for the federal government to buy when they can get money for it. And what, what happens is the federal government, frankly, illegally, tells the Nature Conservancy that we want to buy this particular slough over here, or this stretch of coastland over here, or this part of this, part of this valley over there, and with, Congress doesn't want to fund it yet, but we're going to, we're going to get it eventually. So the, the Nature Conservancy, quite, uh, and they're very, very good at this, goes into those areas and, and looks at who owns what in there, and they don't have the power of condemning, but they go in with all this malarkey about we want to save this for future generations, and we'd like to take an easement on your land right here that uh, you won't use any more water for irrigation than you do, okay? And then they go over and they buy the, they buy the piece over where the water comes from because that's an old couple and they don't have any kids anymore and they don't know what they're going to do. And they, and they buy this piece over there and they lease that piece over there and they wind up consolidating the area with, tied up with easements and everything. And all of a sudden, if, if they paid, let's just for round numbers, we say paid a thousand bucks an acre average for all of this, about five years later, the Fish and Wildlife Service says, okay, we're gonna get money, or the Park Service said, we're gonna get money for this and we're gonna buy it next year. So they tell Congress they need enough to pay $1,800 or $2,400 an acre for all of this land in there. And then the people that signed easements or have you know leased their land, they say, well, I can't live here with a park or refuge all around me, I'll sell out too. And they sell out at, to, the, to the Fish and Wildlife Service at an even lower grade so that the Nature Conservancy gets the higher cost profit and the ones that the holdouts are the ones that they say well you know nobody's going to want to buy your land anyway so it's not worth a thousand bucks an acre anymore we'll give you 400 an acre whatever so that that's the way when they talk about NGOs and you say even even then I people think of them as sort of a oh I don't know mediocre uh, mediocre medium environmental group, not real bad, not real good, buying land, you know, saving the wildlife, et cetera, and the ecosystem. But there, they collude with the government, and that's really all illegal. The government's got no business going out there and secretly planning with you to buy my property four or five years from now when they get money from you as my agent, but nobody knows you're my agent. So that, that was that. Now, Hatch Act, that was pack, passed a long time ago, and I, I mean by 40, 50 years ago, maybe more. And that makes it illegal for a current government employee to uh, campaign in a, in a political campaign for a candidate. And I, the reason it came up in the conversation that brought up the Hatch Act was we were talking about they may investigate or maybe even indict the acting director of the, the FBI for his wife just ran for Congress in Virginia and received $70,000 from the Democratic National Committee and the governor of Virginia to run. And he, they've got pictures evidently of him out there with vote for my wife for Congress and him holding up things. And he's, people know he's Mr. McCabe, he's the acting director. I mean, it would be bad enough he was, if he was just an agent and maybe hardly anybody in the neighborhood knew he was active he was doing that but when it's that that bold because there hasn't been a lot of enforcement about that stuff and there's a good reason to keep the bureaucrats out of politics but politics in the last 30 years and the bureaucrats are 
it's you know, it's just awful. They just become one. You know, I, they each do each other's job and work, and uh, you know, it's all. I, I explained it the other day when I gave a talk that when they when they say they need a law for endangered species, just take that as an example, and that was sponsored in large measure by President Nixon at the time, and I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, that and a couple of other environmental laws he and for he used to kind of divert people from the whole Watergate thing, hoping in the, in the end of Vietnam and all of that. And Ford used a lot of those, sponsoring those kind of laws to, uh, to get reelected in his own right. Well, both were kind of a failure, but it sort of was the foot in the door for the environmentalists, the animal rights people, and it just, it's just been a big snowball since then. But be that as it may, when they pass a law like that, let me explain to you how it's done. Uh, I'm a congressman, say Jim Beers, and I, I go over and talk to Senator Snodgrass over there, and, and the two of us say, well, we're going to sponsor the Ecosystem Savior Act of, you know, whatever, whatever. And I said, we give publicity, we have a few hearings, and I said, what do we do then? I said, we turn over to our chief staff person, we'll get together with the right people and write this. Well, who's the right people? The right people for a fishery thing or wildlife thing is the Fish and Wildlife Service. The right people for the forestry thing is the Forest Service. So they, they go over there and they get, get together and make a work group with one or two guys like me from Fish and Wildlife or some, and themselves, and we sit down and we draft out what it ought to look like here and what it, in the law. And I think about this. The primary thing, I'm sorry about if staff people are offended, but it's the truth, the primary thing that keeps you in your job when you're a staff person for a Congress or Senator is getting him votes, getting him time on TV, and, and the whole nine yards and being there to, you know, whisper in his ear and all of that. So they're in there to make their sponsor look good. Kind of, what am I in there for? I'm in there, not, a, not just to give them advice, but I'm in there because I want a higher grade level in the government. I got a couple of daughters to marry off, right? A college bill's coming. I'm, I'm in there because the guys I like or gals I like, I want to get them promotions so that they will back me up with Everest. And I do that by getting them more people. And of course, we all live off the mother's milk of bureaucracy, which is money. And we want more money. So we tell them, well, we need to have more money for this, and we can't do that without this. And it's enlarded in there is all of these other primary goals, just like the staff guys. So when the, the law passes, we take the law and immediately go and write regulations, OK? And now in this modern new world where the Hatch Act doesn't, doesn't apply and where we can go to the Nature Conservancy and tell them things we shouldn't tell them and, and nobody gets in any trouble, what do we do? We go over with the Defenders of Wildlife and the Wildlife Federation and the Animal Defense League and the Natural Resources Defense Council and we sit down after hours and, and go over the regulations and they observe that, well, you know, that should say may do that instead of shall so that da, da, da. and this over here should talk more about the need for the uh, our authority to take without compensation without saying it property whatever because that and we all like that because we're all going to get more authority we're all because i'm smarter than the rest of you you know so i i know the better use for the property and this and that so the regulations are tweaked and then we have precedents we are, we will sit down with them and say we need to have a judge tell us that we'll take this particular piece of property by just saying this, but not really have to pay for it, and we'll go to Judge Bozo, and there are a lot of courts and justices and you know, judges that are, are bozos for the environmental movement or whatever. You saw that with the, uh, with the court hearings at, on whether or not President Trump had the right to keep people from Six Nations out, okay? There are certain judges you say, where is he? Where do they come up with that? Well, they go to those judges and they get hearings that's and findings that say, yes, the uh, federal government has the right. And most of the time, they've already thought it through that you're a little operator and you can't come back because it'll cost you millions of dollars to carry this forward through the appellate court and up to the Supreme Court, and you aren't sure what's going to happen, so it holds. And you do that with, with special things. And then you take and you write policies. Our policy regarding endangered species that occur on a mixture of state, federal, and private lands, blah, 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 like this. And it's all thought through with the, the law that gives us more power and authority and, and money, and the regulations that will keep it there and consolidate the more authority thing 
which we can always use to say, look, it's, it's under our authority that we need more of these things here, and we've determined that they're endangered, and, and we need to get more money for that, and even though you might think it's a state function or a private function, whatever. So you, the states become subcontractors. I just saw that in this meeting. I've been in with the governors here. The governors become sort of supplicants to the state or the federal dollars that they can get. And, and it also brings out of the woodwork, in the case of fish and wildlife, and I think probably in the case of uh, range management and forest management, all these professors that are specialists, like, a, like a, some guy that's a, a specialist in bats or some other off spiders or some other off the wall thing. I mean, they're mostly guys that grew up loving bats and building bat houses out in the backyard and you know whatever and went off to college and got a PhD in the study of bats and got a job at a university and they're known as a leading authority on bats blah 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 blah. Well those guys number one they their motivation is they want to get more uh, graduate students because the more they have the, the closer and quicker and more sure is tenure. They want to get money in there so that their salary goes up in there but even more than those things, they want notoriety. So they come out and say that the, 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 the southern portion of the Indiana bat population that lives in, in caves as opposed to those that are found in barns or whatever it is they come up with are really in very drastic trouble. And we need to, they should be declared and they write up the justification for, Fish and Wildlife Service loves these people, okay? So does the Defenders of Wildlife and that because it, it increases all of the responsibilities and power. So they put them on the endangered species list and then they use me, the bad authority, my graduate students to generate the things about, you know, this is what's got to be done. Either we get this this habitat under federal control or, you know, the world's going to come to an end because there won't be enough bats to eat the mosquitoes or whatever else it is they come up with, say. So that's the kind of thing, again, that I, I try to explain to people. And I'm not, I'm not saying these are bad people, they're humans just like the rest of us, we've all got our foibles. But government has been dramatically changed by this. And unless we stop it and reverse it, and I can hear them all coming unglued out there like, oh no, we're not, we're not gonna, you're, gonna, you're, gonna, you're disruptive, you're not one of these guys that just wants everybody to get along or something. No, I don't. I want to have a government under a constitution that was like we had that made us so successful all these years. And what I see right now is a government going the way of Europe in so many ways. We got the, you're, you've got the same problems over there. You've got wolves all over the place now. And they're sacred and you can't shoot them. And, and they're decimating the uh, sheep industry over there, which is very extensive. They bring them into the villages with, at certain times of the year. and around the, They move them, the flocks around. And they've got shepherds and the wolves are still killing them at night, right and left, killing the dogs that are supposed to guard them. And I mean, there's so much nonsense out there, but be that as it may. I hope to make, do some good in this and make some progress. So with that, that's it about Nature Conservancy and Hatch Act.